I want to introduce Dan Weitzel. Dan is from Alchemies, and he is going to take us on a virtual field trip uh, to a part of Ohio you may not be familiar with and to a business that is there that you also may be unfamiliar with. So Dan, take us away. So um, I've got a PowerPoint to show and some, and some, um, some various videos around our manufacturing pro process, but first to introduce myself, I'm Dan Witzel. I'm um, the Senior Director of Quality at Alchemies, and uh, I love doing things like this. This is, I would love for everybody to come into the site and have us walk through. Um, it's something that we, we like to do a lot with folks. So um, I know with the COVID situation, it's a little bit difficult, but thanks for the opportunity to at least do this this part um, for your meeting today. Um, I'm going to share my screen and the presentation. And hopefully you all can see this. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, I think we all can see it. All right, thank you. And, and I know this is usually when we do a tour, um, there's a lot of questions. So if, if you need to break in for, with a question, uh, just speak right up because there's a lot of information I'm trying to cover in slides. Um, and I, I have time. So, you know, I know you guys are busy uh, doing your Bradford assays and some of those things. I actually got to watch a little bit of that. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, done Bradford before done other types of protein assays. Um, so like I said, I'm, I love doing this kind of thing. And, and if there's uh, future work that you guys want to do together, I'm open for that as well. Um, so about Alchemies, you know, Alchemies has been around for quite a while. It was found, founded in 1991 by a, a group of Cambridge, uh, Cambridge uh, Massachusetts uh, medical doctors. And what, they, what we've done over the course of the years is, is expanded into a global con, uh, company. <clears throat> We're actually headquartered in Dublin, Ireland. Our CEO is in Waltham, Mass. We have a manufacturing site in Athlone, Ireland that mainly does tablets. And then our site in Wilmington, Ohio that does uh, sterile products and tablets. And it's strange because we're in, we're in um, Wilmington, Ohio, and it's grown from a, a company that had maybe 12 to 15 people to over, um, over 600 now at this site. Now our company in, in general has, you know, 2,300 right now. It's a large con um, company at this point, and we do a lot of business in central nervous system and oncology. So with the Wilmington site, it's a very large facility in the middle of, um, uh, let's just say a cornfield. So it's, uh, we love it here. Um, there's a lot of um, advantages to being in Wilmington, Ohio. Um, we have a really strong workforce. Uh, we grow consistently and we have some colleges that we draw from that are nearby. You know, uh, we have a lot of students from Wilmington College, uh, Sinclair, uh, Dayton and Cincinnati and, and across my, my background is microbiology, and I, I grew up in St. Louis and ended up here in, in this area. So, um, like I said, our site mainly focuses on long-acting sterile injectables, but we do have um, some clinical capability for biologics. Uh, we work with CHO cells here, and we do have a couple products that we're working through um, getting approval with FDA that are, that are tablets. Our site has full analytical capability and uh, we, we commercialize product worldwide here. This is a, an overhead of the site. If you could imagine, um, if, you, if anybody knows where Wilmington is, this is right where, by de where, uh, where uh, Amazon is now in the, in the uh, air park. So we're, we're real close to that and right by the ag portion of um, Wilmington College. Um, to, the, to the top of this picture is actually Wilmington College um, um, agriculture land. 
and we have a lot of um, a lot of folks that we see out there and students that, that you work. If you look at this, it's interesting. You could see almost by the tops of the building how we've expanded over the years, the different colors and things. Our original footprint here on the, I would say the, the right-hand side in the middle where it says manufacturing is our original footprint where those 15 people used to work. And at that time, our products, uh, at that time, were based on a Metazorb technology, which was developed by a guy named Ralph Stolle. And I don't know if anybody knows the story of Ralph Stolle, but he was an entrepreneur that came up with a lot of um, various and innovative things, and he dabbled in pharmaceuticals and, spo and sold it off at one point. Um, I think one of the big things that he invented was the, if you remember, if you're as old as me, the flip top that pulls all the way off, he invented the one that doesn't pull all the way off. So the current one that you see. So it's kind of an interesting tidbit. We're being a, being a pharmaceutical company, we're heavily regula regulated. So we get, we get tons of visitors from different countries and you can see over the years, we've had so many different countries come in here for inspections. Uh, some of our products are, are marketed in 98 countries. So, you know, a, a, kind of a small company in Little Old Wilmington supplies medications worldwide, which is fantastic. Our primary focus is manufacturing extended leave, extra, extended relief, yeah, I can't even say it. Extended release injectables. And these are some of the products I'll go into a little bit later, but what we focused on is a product that maybe is a little bit hard for compliance for the patient. So if you think of, you know, um, Vivitrol is for opiate abuse and alcohol abuse. If you have an option to take a tablet or you get a month long injection, it's a lot better for compliance if you have that continued dose after a month. And the same with risperidone where that's uh, for schizophrenia and bipolar. So we've, we've built the platform here that meets the needs for some very important diseases that we see in the, you know, in the country. And going into the technology platforms that we have, the first one that we developed is microspheres. And with a microsphere, what we do, if you think of a, of a micelle, and you think of an oil and water mixture, if you think of um, even something like solid dressing, when you shake it up, you see the little droplets. This is a similar type of thing where we take one solution that we call the oil phase, which is our active pharmaceutical ingredient, the polymer, which is a biodegradable polymer, and some solvents, and we mix that with water and a surfactant, and that goes through a through pressure and sterile filters. It goes through a mixer, and it creates microspheres. These microspheres are about 100 microns, so they're very small. And what those microspheres do is encapsulate the drug within a, a matrix of polymer, and that polymer de degrades over time to release the, the active pharmaceutical ingredient. This is a, just a picture of what that bulk process looks like. The way we manufacture these microspheres, the first step takes about 30 minutes. This actual ex, you know, extraction and all that to make the microspheres, it takes about 30 minutes. The rest of the process is eliminating solvents from the, from the microspheres and drying the product, and it takes about seven days. And out of this whole process, we get about 15 kilograms of, of material to put into vials. And it's a sterile closed process, so this entire, um, this piping, these tanks, all of this needs to be sterile. So it's, it's quite unique uh, as a process um, in our industry. This is a mechanistic picture of, of what a microsphere does in the body. So when, when you get an injection of one of our products, the body hydrates it, 
and then over time it releases that drug so that you get a nice steady flow of drug into the system and that basically breaks down into uh, lactic acid and water. Um, the microsphere then erodes away and what you do is you, you uh, whether it's a two week injection or a one month or a four month, is you time that next injection so that you get a nice steady flow of, of drug to the patient. This is an example down here on the left hand side bottom. Those are what microspheres look like um, under um, electron micrographs. So this is, they're, they're like a little ball of um, kind of polyester ball. And again, like I mentioned, this is the benefit of microspheres um, to, to the patient is it gives it a nice steady dose and eliminates the need for daily dosing. So if you think about an opiate abuse candidate, a, a patient, where if they get up every morning and they have to take something um, for opiate abuse, if they get an injection once a month, it gives them a nice steady dose, and we've seen some success with that. Um, when you look down below, th this is an example of the product in the vial. Uh, we actually fill these into sterile vials, and then in the kit, what you do is you take a, um, uh, a liquid diluent, you put it into the vial, you draw it out with a syringe and you give the injection. So it's a real interesting um, platform um, that really helps compliance with the patients. Another depiction of if we were walking through the lines, we'd be looking through a window and this would be the process train that we use. And it's broken down into segments. And like I mentioned, um, you know, it, it's a sterile closed process. So everything from segment B down is sterile. And in the end, down here in segment E that you see that what looks like a milk can actually is um, where the product collects in the end. And in the end, like I said, you get about 15 kilograms of material that we then put into vials. The um, the different products have different fill capacity, so you can get anywhere from 100,000 vials to 8,000 vials, depending on what the product is. And I'll pause there to see if you have any questions real quick. I do. Um, do you have any, so there's no problem with people developing like an immune response when it's in the solid phase. Right, We've, we haven't seen any, any signs of um, people getting immune, immune response with these products. Uh, the products that we've selected for these types of, of drugs have been well studied, like risperidone has been, um, you know, that's been out there for so long, it's off patent, you know, and um, Vivitrol, the, the base for that is now Trexone, which is, used in a lot of different drugs. Um, so there, there isn't that type of, um, you know, reaction that we see. Yeah, no, I was thinking more of the, the packaging causing any immune response while it's in this solid phase. Not, I mean, the drug, you know, people might have sensitivities, but that's very interesting. Yeah, we, I know with some of the biologics products, those, those tend to have it because one of the products that we're working on is an interleukin. And, um, you know, that interleukin is, is very, um, you know, it's, it, it depends on the people. You can't use it for everybody. It's an interleukin too, you know? So, okay. No, good question. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, like I mentioned, when you get your, we collect the, the microspheres in a can, and then what we do is we fill that into vials. And this is a little bit more straightforward than the bulk process. This takes about eight hours to 12 hours to do. And what we do is, because it's a, because this product is a, a dry powder, um, it's a little bit complicated in that uh, we have to keep it blended the whole time. So. As you look through this process, it's actually should, it goes from right to left where we sieve it in a centrifuge sifter, 
we fill it into sterile vials, and then there's a vial inspection that occurs. So every single vial that we get and that we manufacture, we have to look at um, to look for defects. Some are cosmetic, but others could be more hazardous like uh, broken glass, um, you know, agglomerated microspheres is a problem. There's a lot of different defects that we have that we need to look at, and, and I have some video to show that. Um, I'm, I will stop here. I, I was only to send, able to send a few videos, but hopefully they're queued up. And the first one, if you can queue up video one, is a video of our filling line, and it shows the vials that are sterile going through the process and um, getting filled, and then they they exit a hole. So basically, you fill them and you you put them you put a crimp on the top, and I think you guys have seen vials before. So let's see if this comes up. You can see in the middle here that powder. That's the actual powder that's getting filled into the vials, and it fills eight at a time, and then the vials move down to this stoppering station where a rubber stopper is put in play. And then at the end of the line, what you'll see is a, a window that goes into a capper where they put a put they put on a loop of cap on it and seal it. Now you could go ahead and stop the video there if you want. The um, that sterile process, um, that room is actually a controlled environment. So you'll see later on, I have some pictures of people gowned from head to toe. And they're gowned in sterile gowns. We do environmental monitoring of that space. And we have um, a lot of very strict controls around that, that um, it's almost like a hospital setting. And for those of you, if you know anything about aseptic filling or aseptic uh, sterile environments, uh, it's what they call uh, grade A, which is 100 particles per, per cubic meter. It's, it's extremely clean. There's a set, now if you queue up video two, video two gives a, gives a, what a, a description of what I was mentioning around the visual inspection. So every vial gets 100% visually inspected. We have, for doses that are lower, this is an example of Risperdal Consta. And this is being, every single vial gets inspected by, by a person looking at that vial as it's displayed to them. And they have about 30 seconds to punch a button and say, this is a reject. So if you can imagine, you know, we have to build in eye examinations for these folks. We build in breaks every 15 minutes. Um, these guys have one of the most important jobs in the, in the company because every single vial has to meet a criteria for inspection. Every single vial gets looked at. And it's the same with our syringes as well. Next slide, there's a, or I'm sorry, the next video is a description of bigger doses. Vivitrol is a gram of powder in a vial, and they have to do this manually. And this is a little bit different than, than the other, is you can do multiples at a time. So you can imagine a batch of 10,000, a batch of 10,000 uh, units getting hand inspected on every single batch. There's a lot that goes into it. Now I'll pause right there to see if anybody has any questions. Um, I'm curious as to what the visual rejection percentage rate is. It's very low and for the different criteria we have, um, we have it ranked between critical defects down to minor cosmetic and you would see probably more minor cosmetic than you would any critical ones. Critical ones could be batch failures. So 
We don't get many of those. The types of things we see are scuffs. We might see some particulate matter uh, that's adhered to the vial, but the majority of them, we would, when I say low, it's like 0.01%. It's very low. That's awesome. Yep. You have a question about the source of your vials and if uh, this uh, current situation that we're in, uh, I have no, I'm a microbiologist, but I have no background in this type of thing. Uh, current situation with uh, COVID vaccines, if if they if they might abscond with every vial there is for something like that, or or what's that situation like? Yeah, with our, with our COVID situation right now, the vent we've seen this with multiple vendors that uh, with with the um, vaccines that are coming out, they're diverting all the materials to vaccine production. And uh, we've seen a scarcity in, in materials across the board in our in our site because uh, we've had to we've had to stockpile vials we've had we've had to stockpile masks and sterile gowning. It, does that answer your question or? Yeah, I was just wondering. Uh, uh, th th that's pretty much it. And if at some point maybe well, you guys obviously if you're stockpiling have thought about. Um, you know how what a well you can't say it's a danger to your business because of the nature of it but uh mm -hmm. you know impact your business i should say oh yeah it's huge and and i think the uh contingencies that we built we've we've had to um, as soon as we started getting word of this we started building contingency and and a lot of people did you know a, a lot of people it's not just toilet paper, right? <laughs> Everybody kind of jumped up and, you know, tried to keep our business going. Um, where we, we've been very lucky with everything considering what's been going on. We've been lucky to maintain manufacturing and not have a hiccup. Um, we've had to get creative with some suppliers and um, get alternate vendors. And that's part of our program anyway, to, to buy down risk. Uh, we did have a scare with vials this year because of the the um, you know the the vaccines that are coming out. They're they're gobbling up all the materials. Yep. Thank you. Yep, no problem. The products, and I'll go into the different products now, and and kind of uh, like I said, I've got a lot of information, and I know I only have so much time, but um, you know I I hope I can get through everything. Um, the products that we manufacture, Risperdal Consta is for, for schizophrenia. Um, it's been marketed since 2003 and it's marketed in uh, 98 countries all over the world. We work with J&J &J on this and it's one of our staples um, that, we've, that we've built our, our platform on, microspheres. Vivitrol is the other one that's extremely important. Uh, we market this um, in the US only and Janssen markets it in Russia. Um, this is for opiate detoxification and also for um, alcohol abuse. And it's, it's been growing steadily because of the, the epidemic and um, opiate abuse. I mean, you know, this is one thing that I can tell you is um, a very good product to prevent relapse. Um, it, the challenge is getting people to to actually use the the medication and I think all of us are kind of touched by a lot of these types of medications that we make. Um, people have, have said Vivitrol is a lifesaver to their to their families. I mean, um, we we would hope someday that you know, believe it or not, we get sales off this, but we would hope someday that the sales would actually go down and we'd address the opiate addiction. You know, but that's that's uh, Vivitrol. The other platform we have, which is fairly interesting, is um, around long-acting injectables that we call Linker X. And what Linker X does, Aristata is one of the products that we use. This was a product called Abilify, and you've probably seen commercials for Abilify. And Abilify had some adverse reactions when injected. 
So what we did is we created a linker in a tail, and that's where the link RX comes in, that makes it more tolerable in the body, and we also made it longer acting. So we took something that was short-lived tablet and turned it into a long-acting injectable. And we also have different doses depending on the severity of the illness. This is um, a depiction of the line where we make it. This is a little bit different in, in that the only thing that we do is we, we recrystallize the API, um, the active pharmaceutical agreement into a powder. We put it into a, a diluent and then we fill it and we do a sterile fill. And again, this is another process that is a sterile closed system. This doesn't take nearly as long as, as the um, microsphere process. It only takes a few days. Now, our filling capability is a little bit different. I don't have a video for it, but I, would, I figured I would just show you the line. If you can see in that picture above, there's a kit on the left-hand side where you can kind of see syringes in that kit. So it's, it's all the... Pardon me? You need to share your screen again. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Hang on. Share screen. Did it come up? Yes. Okay. It's it's funny because I can't I can't progress the um, thing and see you guys at the same time. So <laughs> sorry, <laughs> <laughs> can't tell. Um, all right. So let me get it in PowerPoint mode here. So on this um, on this syringe filler. If you can see that at the top picture, there's syringes going on into the left-hand side, and then they come up, they get filled by robotics throughout this process, and then they get put right back in the kit, and it comes out the other side. Um, so we have, a, we have a very high capability of manufacturing these syringes. Um, the advantage, I will say, is the previous products Risperdal and Vivitrol, you have to fill a diluent separately. So you take a diluent, which is aqueous based, you take it out of the vial, you put it into the vial with powder, shake it up, draw it out, give the injection. This is all in one. So it's the advantage in any of the new products that we work on that are sterile will be in this platform because it doesn't take, you know, two different um, elements in the kit. It's just all packaged in the one syringe. Hey, Dan, I have a yep. question. Um, when you take, so you're saying you basically you took a drug that was already on the market and kind of are revamping the formulation of it. When that happens, does it like, I don't even know how to ask the question, but basically like you were saying you're working with off patent drugs. Does it then get a new name and go back in patent or how does that part of it work? Mm, yeah, there's, there's, Yep, there's there are two different ways you can do it. One is you can you can do it through a um, a type of supplement that leverages that data from the previous company, um, and then it becomes a generic. Or you cre create a new chemical entity. In this case, we added this linker and tail, and it became a new chemical entity. So. Mm -hmm. There are two different routes you could do that, and in this in this case, and with um, with Risperdal Const, it was the same chemical entity, so it was an expansion of that brand, that brand. Um, with Vivitrol, it was an expansion of of the use of naltrexone. With this, it's a new chemical entity. Okay, so it just depends on which substance you're working with, basically. Yeah, yeah, and and actually. The interesting thing from a law perspective is we did get pet pushback from the company that, that created Abilify. You know, there, there were lawsuits, there were, there were lots of things because they, they didn't see this as a, as a different chemical entity. And we, we won the lawsuit and have marketed it, so, yep. 
So I kind of mentioned we have some clinical ability and, and uh, with tablets. When you see a number like AUX 3831 or 4230, those are new, that's our R&D type acronyms. And 3831 is Elanzapine and Samidorphin. Samidorphin is similar to naltrexone. And what this does is this is another um, drug that's regularly used, olanzapine, that we've, we've done a bilayer tablet with samidorphin, and you get the effects of olanzapine, the antipsychotic effects, without the weight gain that olanzapine would see. And this is relatively mm -hmm. significant. This product's going through review with FDA right now. Um, we've had a successful um, FDA advisory board um, that recommended approval, so we're anticipating getting approval for this. Um, and this is, again, it's the weight loss is significant for folks that are on antipsychotic medications. And if we can mitigate that through this, the use of Samidorphin, then um, that's an advantage. It's the first tablet in our Wilmington facility, so we're pretty anxious about this going through. Next slide. Oh, this is another example of um, the title of our, pro I don't know who comes up with these names, but uh, Labaldi is the, the name of the, the product once it becomes marketed. Um, there's many different things that are going to come out, different doses, different uh, packaging configurations, and uh, we're looking forward to making that a marketed product here. It's a little bit different in the sterile process. It's non-sterile, so the controls are a little bit lighter. The gowning is a little bit lighter. Um, this is just a depiction where we take the two blends, we put them together to form a bilayer tablet. This press basically goes through and it, it'll make one layer, flip it over and add the next layer to it and compress it together. And then we put a coating on it to make it more tolerable in the body. Next slide, come on. Oh, there we go. I'm having to progress my slides differently. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned biologics. Now, we have a product that um, we manufacture from, um, from a clinical stand, small-scale standpoint now, and we look to commercialize, it, commercialize this later, you know, um, but, but it is an interleukin. Um, we've seen some success in various cancers uh, recently in some of the clinical trials that we've done, um, some lung cancer, ovarian, it's being used in conjunction with some other drugs. So this is another thing that, um, that, that we're working on. There's different types of interleukins, um, and that's, a, that's actually a picture of what it would look like from, um, from a standpoint of a molecule. Um, ours is a little bit in, unique that we have some different binding sites on it. Um, it's a fusion protein, if you folks know anything about fusion proteins. And we manufacture this through CHO cells. Whoops, I went too far. So when all this gets done, so we, do, we make all this product, it has to go to our quality groups to um, test it and to release it. And say we put the stamp on it that we have a good batch and, and it goes out the door. And through that, the chemistry lab has a number of different tests that we do um, to show that this product is safe for humans. We have specifications that they need to meet. Um, these are some examples being a long acting injectable. Uh, we do in vitro testing, which mimics the body. So we put it into um, a diluent and we measure the release over time. There's other things that we do to, for purity, uh, some GC for residual solvents, uh, particles matter, so particle size matters. Um, there's quite a bit of testing that we do there. And then from the, from the micro lab standpoint, I kind of mentioned environmental monitoring. We do have a sterile process, so environmental monitoring 
is really important. We monitor the air, the gases that go in. Um, we monitor the people. This is an example of somebody fully gowned. Um, and that's what they would look like on that fill line that you saw. They would be working in there fully gowned. And we, we design these uh, to mimic the interaction between the people and the product. We have a number of tests that we do, and, and, and the number down there is around 145,000 per year. <laughs> it, it's huge. And um, I think that's actually kind of low because these are just to release product. It's not, uh, not some of the experimental tests we do. The other thing I mentioned that being a sterile product is we have to do sterility testing, and that's a picture of somebody working in an isolator um, that's taking our product and putting it into growth media to see if it's sterile. And this is somebody, you know what, I tried to get some videos of the lab in, but I, my um, corporate communication group did not get them to me in time to include them. So I apologize for that. I had placeholders for videos of some of the lab stuff, but I don't have the videos. I just have some pictures. Again, the important thing for the sterility test is that they're separated from the product so they don't accidentally introduce some, some um, contaminants. And then we have some other microbiologists doing plate reads. Um, this individual on the left-hand side is doing an endotoxin test, which is based on a, um, uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the limulus amoebicide lysate test, the LAL test. So he's doing one that's a, he's doing a kinetic chromogenic method there that uh, basically you add the reagent to the lysate, um, you add the sample to the lysate, and then it measures uh, change in color over time to a standard series. The good, good thing with that, I saw you guys um, doing your cubettes. The good thing with this, that's all on a microtiter plate and a machine reads it for you. So <laughs> makes it a little bit easier. Is the particle size of your product pretty standard or is it all over the place? That's a hard test to run. <laughs> Yeah, we, we do um, target about 100 microns, and you do see a range. We see a range from around 75 to 120. We have a, we have a specification. That particle size matters because um, it sets the release of the product. So, you know, if our particle size is too large, we typically, typically get slow release. You know, you can imagine larger particles are going to erode slower. And then if it's too small, it can, it can release too fast. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty critical. And that's the unique thing, that um, static mixer that I mentioned is about this long. And that's where the magic happens. That's where the oil and water mixtures come together. The microspheres are formed, and then they're, they're hardened in the next steps where we dry it and, and um, what we call quench them. So they might be soft microspheres in the beginning, but they end up being like hard beads. Somebody in the chat asked, what's the education requirements for your employees? Yeah, so we, we have um, different requirements for different levels. I would say we have people right out of high school all the way up to PhDs. And we hire, I would say the majority of the hires that we do, you know, these individuals here um, may have started as temporaries while they were still in college getting a biology degree or a micro degree, you know, or a chemistry degree. We hire a lot of interns. Uh, we hired an intern from, um, I can't remember which program, it might have been Jamie's, but I'm not sure. But um, we've hired folks from these feeder programs uh, from the high schools um, as interns that have turned into permanent jobs. Manufacturing, depending on what the job is, we like to hire people with college, college degrees and then work them up in the company. But again, it's, 
um, for a laboratory job, we do also hire people that, um, that, that have an aptitude for laboratory. So we have hired people that have nursing degrees um, to be microbiologists and that kind of thing. So, yeah. Somebody asked if you hire old teachers. <laughs> we do. You have a summer, yeah. you need a summer internship program for teachers. So we, we, we don't have, what we can do, like, like I was saying, what we've done in the past is we've done tours, we've sponsored training, you know, on certain things. If, um, we've sponsored um, some of the, you know, like I'm a sponsor to Green County's uh, biotech program. We have other people that sponsor those programs and we do tours, we do, uh, we have, we've done um, student work, you know, like like uh, school projects with students. So there, there's a lot of stuff that we do. I think the advantage is we're a small company, you know, compared to um, compared to a lot of bigger companies like our the site in Athlone, Ireland, and the, the site in Athlone and the site in Boston. It's a little bit harder for people to get into. I'll tell you, this is the end of my presentation. So let's, I'll field any questions folks have. Oh, I just I just looked at the anybody have other questions. I think we've got the the video or the sound issue taken care of, but We do hire old teachers. <laughs> <laughs> Say what? I said we do hire old teachers. Um, you know, we do we hire young teachers. We <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, well, we're all looking for a new job, right? Um, the, I like this question too. Is this the same technology used in diabetes medicines like Trulicity that's once a week? I mean, are, are you guys the holders of this microsphere patenting or are there other pharmaceutical groups that are using that? There are other pharmaceutical groups down in Westchester, um, Ohio. There's a company called AstraZeneca and we developed a product by Durian that's using the same, it's a long acting injectable for um, diabetes. Trulicity is a little bit different. It's not a microsphere. It's more similar to our Link RX, but it's a, it's, it's a long acting injectable in a similar fashion there. The microspheres are a little bit touchy because they're, they're, um, they're, they're subjective to um, temperatures not far above room temperature. So our stability of, of our product at room temperature is about six months. So it's, it's, it's pretty weak. Um, it's a polylactide, polyglycolide bead. So it breaks down like a suture, you know, it breaks down over time. And it, when you let that, that's how you put it, when you put it in the body, it's got a short, shelf life there, you know, 30 days, less, maybe less than 30 days. But um, it's kind of one of those things that um, why we move towards something that's a little more robust in the body. The, um, the product um, Aristata that we have, that is one that is a room temp um, product. And the shelf life is like four years. So Tree treatments. Yeah, Kelly, do you want to ask a little bit about that? I don't know what that is. Oh, like if you, for certain deciduous trees, you can uh, literally 
inject straight into their uh, xylem and it carries, it goes to stomach. But mm. wow, this would be awesome for a, a whole season long treatment to, to these hard to treat diseases that are wiping out big populations. Well, that, that is, that's fascinating to me. You know what I mean? It's, um, it's something that folks don't talk about much. You know, we, we talk a lot about animal health, you know, um, that's, that's an yeah, interesting, it's great for, you know, I could think that it could be definitely applied to, uh, you know, pets or in, in animals, farm animals, you know, because you're not going to shove a pill down their throat every day. Right. But for trees. That's, I was just thinking about that. If it just takes water and time, then that's amazing. Yeah, I don't know if anybody's done any research on that, but I'll tell you, that would be really interesting to do. So the polymer, sorry. <laughs> it's always a lot of feedback when I start talking, sorry. Um, <laughs> the polymer that you're using on those microspheres, is that is that a plant-based polymer? Is that something that you're creating in the lab before you're, you're or is that some natural occurring extraction that you're making from some plant based product or or some other product no, it's real simple it's taking uh, glycolide glycolic acid and uh, lactic lactic acid with a with a tin polymer in a in pr under pressure and creating that polymer it's basically a long chain of glycolic acid and lactic acid in, in a certain in a certain um, ratio so the polymer that we use for bidurion is 50-50 glycolide and lactide. The polymer we use for Aristata is 75 to 25. And the, the chain length makes it, um, you know, either less or more durable in the body. And it, when it breaks down, it breaks down into lactic acid, glycolic acid, and water. You know, it just breaks down and that's it. That's mm -hmm. amazing.